Our first speaker is someone who's known a lot about homelessness, having it experienced personally. And he's um, been working full-time in the speak field of homelessness and how to address it ever since a, a young age, his whole professional career. His name is Paul Bowden, and as I said earlier, he's the executive director of RAP, Western Regional Advocacy Project. And um, he began volunteering at a drop-in shelter in San Francisco in 1983 and eventually became the program director there. He worked as a case manager in support of hotel programs for the mentally ill people. And he's, uh, as I mentioned, served as the executive director for the San Francisco Coalition on Homelessness for 16 years, was a founder of the Community Housing Partnership, a nationally recognized permanent housing corporation with optional supportive services. He served as a president of its board for 10 years. He is also a member of the National Coalition for Homelessness and co-chair of its civil rights and grassroots organizing workshop, work group. He has received dozens of community awards during the last 25 years and recognition from the city and county of San Francisco, the state of California, and the Congress of the United States. Paul regularly writes articles and op-eds and travels throughout the country giving talks and trainings. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you all for, for that nice round of applause. Um, yeah, I, I came up off the streets. Um, I was homeless at the age of 16 in New York City. Um, this was in the late 70s, but it was a very different situation for me personally. I was a white boy from Long Island, middle class, went to a good school, got kicked out of some good schools. Um, and my mom died and my father kicked us all out and put us in the street. And what has stuck with me now, 50 years later, 35 years later, is it was the most mind-blowing experience from the context of if we're living comfortable middle-class lives and we think that's the reality in America and the privileges that we have, if we think those privileges are available to all, we're crazy. That, that is not what this country is all about. And the experience of going from that privileged position to living in the streets of New York City to ending up in the Tenderloin in January of 1983 and the pouring rain that was going on at that time. You know, I was lucky. Hospitality House is a place where you didn't just be a client. You were a part of a community. And we were all shocked that so many people, Hospitality House had been around since the 60s. They used to close at 11 o'clock at night and people went home. By October of 1982, they were closing at 11 o'clock at night and people were standing there because they had nowhere to go. That wasn't created by homeless people. That wasn't a choiceful situation. So we recognized that there was a systemic issue here, that our DNA did not change. People didn't suddenly start deciding that sleeping out in the freaking streets in New York City, in Chicago, in Bozeman, Montana, in San Francisco, California, that suddenly that was a lifestyle that seemed really attractive and seemed really cool. That's not what went down, but it is how we've been addressing the issue since day one. No, not since day one. Day one, we actually saw it as a crisis. FEMA funded our first shelter programs. That tells you it was identified as a crisis that was happening in this country, not just in this city, in this country. And so we recognized that there was something that we all had in common. We all came from different places. We all came from different situations, but we had certain things in common. But what, what we decided we needed to do was stop this discussion about rehabilitating us to fit into society and make sure that there was a context like we saw during the Great Depression when we created what today is called HUD, when we had a WPA program to address unemployment, when we, when we built infrastructure using the labor and the skills and the talent of people that were poor and homeless at the time, and when we in fact protected people that were living in encampments by having the federal government protect them from local vigilantes and from local sheriff's departments. We were taking a totally different systemic approach to a national issue that we weren't seeing starting in 83 when we created a homeless program. Creating a homeless program does not eliminate homelessness, folks. It perpetuates it. 
We needed to create a housing program if we really wanted to address homelessness. And so we're like a think tank now. From the Homeless Coalition, we spread out. We have organizations in Colorado, uh, Oregon, and California, and throughout California, that all had the same issues in mind. We needed to stop the gentrification, we needed to replenish the affordable housing funding, and we needed to stop criminalizing people out of existence. The first thing we looked at in 1937, we created affordable housing programs. This was the language of the Housing Act in 1937, to ensure that all people had, and all families, and had a safe, sanitary place to live. In 1998, we did the, well, the contract on America. We did welfare reform. We impact, we aid to families with dependent children became temporary aid for needy families. And we see the impact when families are temporarily out of that program as opposed to having it based on need. And they changed the preamble to the Housing Act to say that they cannot be held accountable to ensure that even a majority of people have access to affordable housing. You want to start talking about UN human rights, you want to, the housing rapporteurs report, the extreme poverty rapporteurs report, they all saw this as systemic causes for addressing what we're seeing in our streets today, but the local governments continue to perpetuate with outreach programs and policing programs and sweeping encampments and saying there'll never be another tent in the streets. There's going to be tents in your streets until you address the systemic cause of why those tents are there in the first place. This is just a massive example of, <coughs> no shit, thank you. Um, this, is, this, is, this, is a bit, this is just looking at the sheer numbers. And these numbers are like uh, four years old. They get, unfortunately, with RAD and public housing, it's gotten much worse. But you eliminate 800,000 units of affordable housing, you're going to have homelessness in your community. Those units were not empty. They were not unneeded. There was waiting lists for public housing long before we opened our shelter programs. You take 800,000 units out of the affordable housing stock, you're going to put families and, and single adults and disabled people and non-disabled people and working poor. You're going to put community members that need housing in the streets. And this is rural housing programs, folks used to be USDA funded rural housing because it made sense they were already in rural communities. Right after attacking HUD, within two years after Reagan and Reaganomics and neoliberal economics took over our federal government, we started attacking the rural programs. And rural homelessness is overwhelmingly family homelessness. And the redefinition of families with the Hearth Act and the way that we're addressing, you saw that point in time headcount article and they say families stay stable. Families are redefined out of being homeless. They're not housed out of being homeless. This is just in our public housing stock where guess what? The majority of people that were undocumented, they can no longer live there. The majority of the people are people of color and poor people. They can no longer live there. We have eliminated this funding stream and said the only housing that's worthwhile is housing that's a commodity. And we quadrupled our homeowners housing programs. We do housing assistance like we've never done it before. We changed who we do it for. I own a home, I pay interest, I get a housing subsidy from the federal government. I get it through the IRS, so it's not about charity, it's about economic stimulus. It is still a housing subsidy. My housing is subsidized when I own a home, no questions asked, no criminal background check, nobody counts toothbrushes in the bathrooms to make sure there's nobody not on the lease living there. I get a housing subsidy because I qualify for it. That is not how our housing programs work for poor people. You have to be worthy enough to get a housing subsidy. Not when you're a homeowner, only when you're poor. We do $140 billion in homeowner housing subsidy. We do $34, $37 billion in housing for poor people, yet it's the $37 billion we keep hearing all these asinine arguments about and all of these asinine rules and policies that they're creating to exclude people. The housing subsidy program is God's gift to America because it's capitalism. We say we can't afford it. Take a look at a couple of submarines. Take a look at a couple of battleships. You could quadruple your housing program, and Canada would not be invading us anytime soon. So you would still be pretty safe. Then the response has been at the local level, criminalization. 
oh, we'll make sure, we'll put one person in a navigation center and no homeless person will ever be on that block again. BS. That's not how it's gonna play out, but it does perpetuate the mindset that people have that, well, there's a navigation center, why is this homeless person here? And you see the kind of visceral and the kind of vigilante groups that are forming, the kind of attacks that took place in the Embarcadero. You see that because people believe the rhetoric from the Chronicle and from the local government that it's not our issue to address, it's their issue to address, and we do outreach, so therefore they should be thankful and they should get out of sight and be out of mind, and then we can say we've addressed it. That's the purpose of the Chronic Homeless Program. Single adults in downtown corridors were prioritized because they were the most visible, not because they were the most in need. If you were doing it based on need, wouldn't you think that seniors and families and little kids would be the priority? Yeah. But the most visible was the, the dudes hanging out in downtown corridors, so that became the priority for funding. Therefore, they shut down family programs by redefining family homelessness in order to fund single adult programs in downtown corridors, hoping mistakenly that somehow if they do that, the problem will disappear. It clearly didn't. But what it has led to is a massive increase in the number of laws that are used to criminalize our presence. I told you we were the ALEC of our homeless groups. Well, we're the research arm. With UC Berkeley Law School, we did this research. It don't come out from UC Berkeley Law School unless you can damn well prove it. And as the funding for housing decimated, the number of local laws used to criminalize the presence of people has quadrupled. Sitting, standing, laying down, sleeping, eating are all criminal offenses, yet every single person in this room is going to sit, stand down, lay down, sleep, and eat. Only certain people will ever go to jail for it, and as I'm sure you'll hear, there's a hell of a lot of certain people that literally are sitting in jail because they sat on a sidewalk in the freaking Tenderloin as if that's the most dangerous concern people have that live in the Tenderloin. This is historical. This is an analysis that goes back forever. This country has a long, ugly history of using local ordinances to criminalize the, pe the presence of people they don't like. Sundown towns, ugly laws, anti oki laws, Jim Crow laws, Basarero Tra Act, Japanese American Exclusion Act. They all use the same method. Local laws to criminalize activities that everybody's gonna violate coupled with discriminatory poli policing to put people in jail that you want to get the hell out of your community. The, whole, the old days of this is a sundown town, don't let the sun set on you here, that's no different than what we're seeing today when they talk about sweeping a homeless encampment because it's unhealthy, it's unsafe. Being out on the streets with nothing to protect yourself from the elements is unhealthy and unsafe. Hiding from the cops who are supposed to be protecting you makes you unhealthy and unsafe. If you want to address health and safety, build some freaking housing. Fight with us to build housing. I'll end it there and save the rest for a Q&A. Um, but I do want to say that I think it's important as you look at the local responses that you think about how communities are actively working around building alliances with people, connecting the racism and classism that created contemporary homelessness with the way that we're going to approach this issue to address it, and that human rights means housing as well. And housing is, should be, and can be, and will be one of these freaking days a human right for all people. Thank you. Um, thank you, Paul. That was passionate, and it really appealed to me. It touched my heart, and um, uh, I hope that it converts some of us in here to action. And uh, Paul's group, Western Regional Advocacy Project, or RAP, has a table right over there. And so after the meeting, she, the, this gentleman's raising his hand. Uh, go over there, get their brochures, get on their mailing list, keep in touch, keep informed, and help make the right decisions and end the... Uh, direction that we're going in, turn the ship around, let's see some compassion on the streets and for everybody.